a run-in rebel no longer wants to run on the UNLV court. Instead, sophomore guard Patrick McCaw wants to take his moves to the NBA, declaring for the draft to go pro. Next up, it's big league weekend and professional third baseman for the Chicago Cubs, Chris Bryant, returns to a ball game in his hometown, Las Vegas, for some peanuts and Cracker Jack. You can't miss our Rebel timeout this week. We have professional boxer and WBO welterweight champion Jesse Vargas in the studio. And I bet you always wanted to learn how to kick a football the right way. We're going to show you how. The Rebel Report begins right now. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Rebel Report as UNLV inches towards hiring its new men's head basketball coach. I'm Nakaya Berry. Yeah, and I'm John Castanino. Apparently, we're close to the finish line here. A special session of the Nevada Board of Regents has been called for Friday to discuss and vote on Chris Beard's contract. There's going to be some debate here, but it is expected the contract will ultimately be approved. However, Coach Beard will enter his first season with some recruiting to do after losing another top player from the Rebel roster. Yeah, you all know about it. Patrick McCaw headed to the NBA draft on Monday. McCaw releasing a statement saying he feels he's accomplished what he's wanted in his college career and it's time to take the next step. He thanked his coaches, including Dave Rice, the school and fans. McCaw led the Rebels in scoring last season, averaging just under 15 points a game. He joins Steven Zimmerman now, who declared for the draft just last week. Zimmerman likely a first round pick, but the future a bit more murky for McCaw. He has the potential to go in the first round, but a lot will hinge on his pre-draft workouts. Bottom line for us here, the Rebels are down two players, and reports are swirling that both Dwayne Morgan and Jordan Cornish may be looking to transfer as well. So Coach Beard has some work to do as we've gone over this uh, press conference to formally introduce him. That's going to be scheduled after the Board of Regents meeting. On yes, Friday. we're all looking to get this thing settled. We're in transition now, but we're looking forward to what will happen. Agreed. Big League Weekend returned to Las Vegas last week as the two best teams of the National League, the Chicago Cubs and the New York Mets, squared off. Not only was this a big weekend for baseball in Vegas, it also was the homecoming of Las Vegas native Chris Bryant. Here's Luis Negret with more. The Cubs and Mets are back in Vegas, which marks their turn at Chris Bryant, who last year was fighting for a roster spot and now is Rookie of the Year. After a successful 2015 season, Chris Bryant, the Bonanza High School product, returned to the city to raise him, which brought plenty of memories. I love this city. I mean, um, you know, I plan on living here for the rest of my life. I, I love everything about it. Um, here, I didn't really get the chance to play much here. I think my first time I was playing here was the first uh, big league weekend here, but um, just so many good memories from club ball, the high school ball, and all my friends here. I mean, I can't say enough about the city. Chris was named Rookie of the Year last season and played his first All-Star game, which was nothing more than pleasing to his dad. He came up and uh, very determined to have a good year. And then for, for me, and uh, to sit back and just, just to be able to be a part of it, help getting him through it, you know, taking the edge off, taking the pressure off of facing Major League pitchers every day. And it was... Uh, it, you know, it worked out really well for me. We were pretty happy. And as far as his performance goes, I'm going to tell you he's a much better hitter this year. I've already seen it. Uh, he's driving in runs with singles, which I think is going to put him in that 100 plus category on an annual basis. He's still going to hit his home runs this summer. My point is he's made a lot of adjustments uh, in the count and just in general, just by the uh, path of his swing. So it's a, it's a, it's an even uh, it's a new and improved version of KB from last year, and it's going to keep getting better. Chris Bryant criticizes the success in the beautiful city of Las Vegas. For the real report, I'm Luis Negre. Thanks, Luis. The first MLB exhibition game at Cashman Field was played in spring of 1983 when the Padres faced against the Mariners. All right, to UNLV baseball we go now, and you won't be seeing the Rebels around campus very much. UNLV on the road for basically the month of April. Victoria Bass here to tell us about their last homestand before a monster road trip with 16 of 19 games away from Earl Wilson Stadium. This week we take a look at UNLV baseball's last home game against Texas Tech. 
UNLV finished their two-game series against Texas Tech, where each team won once, with the Scarlet and Gray claiming Monday's affair 8-5. to Obviously winning yesterday was big against a top 20 team, and uh, uh, the way we competed yesterday and the way we performed late in the game, which we hadn't been in the last few few weeks, was, was a positive sign. With the loss of their second game in the short series, the team reflects on how they can improve on the road. Well, we just rehash everything in the game, what we need to do better and where we can improve on, and also what we did right, and, and just an overall summary, we just talk some things out, let them know what's, what's acceptable and what we need to improve on. The freshmen on the team have made an impact so far. There's a lot of freshmen out here, and we're all a pretty good group, and I think the future is bright for us. We have a good group of guys, and we should be fine. But according to Coach, there's still room for improvement. In general, I'm happy with them. They got to keep improving because we've got so many playing. But uh, but I, you know, you almost have to individualize it. Some are doing quite well, and some need to pick it up yet. With the conclusion of their six-game homestand, the Rebels find themselves on the road for eight straight games for their monster road trip weekend. We're all looking forward to that, spending spending time together, and uh, we're going to get some good wins on the road, and I think we'll do so. The squad will play four more away games on April 8th through the 11th before three games set against the Air Force at the Earl E. Wilson Stadium that's scheduled for April 15th through the 17th. The Rebels are currently on their monster road trip and their next game is going to be against San Diego State. Make sure to catch them on April 8th. For the Rebel Report, I'm Victoria Bass. All right, Vicki, thanks. The Rebels beat Grand Canyon in Phoenix on Monday, bumping the team's record to 11 and 17 on the year. So to this point, UNLV has only played four of those 16 games on the road in April. Kyle Isbell, as you heard, doesn't mind those road trips. He's also looking forward to the chance to bond with his teammates. The women's softball team is in the midst of its 2016 season, sitting in seventh place in the Mountain West Conference. The team hosted conference foe Utah State over the past weekend. Joanne Mendoza tells us how the team looks to improve. The UNLV women's softball team took on Utah State University over the weekend, playing in a three-game tournament at Eller Media Stadium. We caught up with them on Saturday during Game 2, where they were shut out by the Aggies 7-0. Quinn Cooper gives us her thoughts on how her team did compared to the previous night against them. Um, the game plan was to still attack the zone, um, hit your spots, jump on the first pitch, but sometimes things just don't go our way. Like yesterday we played far better than we did today, but I mean we still made decent adjustments, but just not enough to come back. Quinn explains to us how her team was just not mentally there. I think the only thing that went wrong was our mental game today. Mentally, I think we're pressing big time and we're all in our own heads. We're not just out there playing. We're more pressing and just trying to be too perfect instead of just out there doing our thing. Utah State ultimately shut out the Rebels during the fourth and the fifth inning when they were able to score six runs on them, leaving them with a record of 18 to 19. For the Rebel Report, I'm Joanne Mendoza. UNLV lost three straight to the Aggies and will return home to face their rivals from the North, UNR, from April 15th to the 17th. So you may have noticed this over the last few weeks as we've had our show, but we have this go-to soccer reporter, Natalia Lancelotti. No games this week for the soccer uh, program. This time she's going to focus on the leader of the team, the head coach. That is correct. Natalia sat with coach Rich Ryerson from the men's soccer team in an exclusive interview for our cameras and talked about Ryerson's career as well as his experience as the UNLV head coach. We're here at the Peter Johan Memorial Field with Rich Ryerson, the head coach of the outstanding UNLV men's soccer team. How are you coach? I'm very well. Thank you for coming over. Oh no, thank you for opening <laughs> the doors for us and get to know you more. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. Ryerson started as a head coach in 2010 after being the assistant of Mario Sanchez for two years, and he described for us his journey with the men's soccer team. Well, I mean, it's an honor for me because I played here at UNLV. The field we're sitting at right now was uh, built in 1983, and that's when I actually was a freshman. With such a career in soccer, Ryerson explained the evolution of the sport. Now the game is uh, extremely fast and, and very technical. 
I think in the 80s we might have lumbered around a little bit more. I think the, the tackling was much harder then. We were uh, allowed to get away with a little bit more uh, physical side, but I think now the, the players that can play are protected a little bit. And uh, so I think it's an exciting game now. I think it's very fast. The players we have are very technical. Uh, we have that strength also in terms of tackling and defending. Uh, but I, the game definitely has changed. Last season, the Rebels step up. During the season, we were in the top 25. We had a, a run of seven games in a row that we didn't lose. And during that period, we were ranked in the top 25. It is said that the head coach is the mind of the team. So I ask coach, what was his strategy for the positive results obtained so far in the season? My strategy is to surround myself with good people and then let them do the things that they do very well. Leaf is a big part of it. The next thing is that you keep coming around and we keep winning. So keep coming around, and that must be the strategy there. <laughs> Ryerson shared the lessons he gives to the players. One of the things is to play with confidence, uh, to work extremely hard, and I think if we're prepared, I think that creates the confidence in the players. And then once they're confident and they're prepared, they're competent in what they do, so they have the skill to do what they need to do at the highest speed and then really just focus on the details. And, and so that's kind of been, again, if we get back to the recipe, that's been something that's been very important for us. Overall, as a coach, you know, he's he feels like he's one of the, one of the other guys on the team. You know, we can joke around with them, we can um, have fun with them, but at the same time, he, he can be serious and, you know, he helps us in every way to guide us to be the great young men that he wants us to aspire to be. Before the games, usually that's when he gets serious. You know, his joking mood kind of turns off and he just tells us, you know, it just really motivates us to work hard out there and work for each other. Coach Ryerson got critical and gave his standpoint of positives as well as negatives. Finishing opportunities when we get them. I think having good delivery in our services and crossing and things like that. Uh, technique can always improve. So I think, you know, just the basic uh, technique and, and how fast they're executing. Uh, those are all things that we want to continue to improve on. Uh, at the same time, I think in terms of, uh, um, I, I guess, the positive things that we're doing right now is that we are creating a lot of chances, we are converting a lot of goals, and, uh, and I think we're doing pretty well on our restarts. So, uh, you know, there's some, some definite positives, but we never feel satisfied. We always want to be better. Reporting for the Rebel Report, I'm Natalia Lancelotti. All right, I insisted that she did more of a feature story this week on a player or a coach. She did a great job there on Coach Ryerson, really got a sense of what he's like, and the players appreciate having him as their head coach. UNLV has one more spring match April 16th. Their season will fire back up in August. Yeah, so another football team on campus, we're talking about American football, the UNLV football team is closing out its series of spring practices this week. The Rebel Report's Cassie Soto. Now she joins us to discuss something that's missing from the team. I'm intrigued with this, Kathy. What are we uh, talking about? Thanks, John. The Rebels only have one practice left before their spring showcase on April 9th. They've worked hard, they put forward their best efforts, but there's still one thing missing from this year's team, and that's senior wide receivers. But it's a good thing. Coming into the 2016-2017 season, the Rebels are said to have had the best recruiting class ever for UNLV. With the recruitment came 23 new players, 10 of which were rated three-star recruits. Zoning in on the wide receivers alone, the Rebels picked up four players for this position, and the leaders for them will not be seniors, but juniors Devontae Boyd and Kendall Keyes. For those who might think that not having any seniors in the wide receiver position might be a setback, Coach Cormier feels differently. I think it's good. I mean, you know, seniors mean we have more time to work with them as a coach. So, uh, you know, it's always that sad part towards the end when you see those guys leave. So now it's kind of a good feeling in the room knowing I'm going to have these guys for the most part for the rest of two years. The fact that there aren't any seniors does not concern the players either. Regardless of what year, you know, you are, we definitely have to have that leader of whatever, um, like, position it is. You know, as receivers, we definitely have to step up. I don't really think it means anything, honestly. I, mean, I feel like the youngest guy could be a leader, no matter what grade you is or what year you are. Regardless of who leads who, Coach knows Devontae and Kendall are more than capable of paving the way for the younger players. Well, those seniors, when they were freshmen, showed them the ropes. So now they're used to they're used to it. Those guys taught those guys how to, how to be leaders, and now they're taking what they learned from the older guys when they were freshmen 
Now they're passing it down to younger guys. Devontae and Kendall both had breakout seasons last year, together catching for over 1,400 yards. With the new recruits, they know they have to come out in full force in order to secure their positions on the field. Energy and a, and a lot of competition. All those guys want to play, so they, they're pushing the guys that have been here and letting them know that their, their position isn't safe. So they're working hard every single day and they're pushing everybody else to keep working hard. You heard the coach and players. It doesn't matter what year you are to show leadership skills, and we hope to see that at the Spring Showcase this Saturday, which will be held at noon at the Peter Johan Memorial Soccer Field. The event is free and open to the public. Now let's toss it over to Justin for this week's Rebel Report Time Out. Rebel Report Time Out. Thanks, Cassie. We're here with our guest, Jesse Vargas, the newly crowned WBO welterweight title champion holder. How does it feel? Hey Justin, well it feels great to be here first of all, right? Thank you for the, for the invite and for having me. And to be a world champion, what can I say? You know, uh, very few could say that and I'm very happy to be with, amongst those. Right. Your last fight was with Saddam Ali, uh, a close fight, but you, you, you won that fight. It, it became the new WBO uh, championship, or champion. How did, um, how, how, was, how tough was that, was that fight coming after that loss with Bradley? Well. You know, um, 2015 wasn't a good year. You know, we, we got a good opportunity, but uh, the fight against Timothy Bradley that I'm speaking of, you know, we uh, had him knocked out in the last round, you know, and, and, and the referee stopped the fight 10 seconds early, right. earlier, right, than, than he should have. So the, he stopped it with time remaining and with me having him severely hurt. Right. I mean, he was ready to hit the canvas. His l glove was literally only a couple inches away from touching the canvas. Yeah. So, you know, that was a lot of frustration into that fight, but... You know, um, right. how does that feel coming, leaving the fight at that point where you thought, you know, you're on the ropes and you thought that you, you, the fight was over. You thought you had won. And how, how, how do you come back from that? You know, there was a lot of confusion at the moment, but afterwards, just a lot of frustration, you know, um, and then that became just, it just built up to a lot of anger, right? you know, because it wasn't something that seemed fair to me. You know, uh, with him, with the referee stopping the fight and then changing his decision, saying, mm -hmm. "No, what? Well, thought I heard the bell ring." I mean, I have never heard anyone say right. I mistake the bell for, for the 10-second mark. You know, which yeah. doesn't make any sense. But hey, we came back stronger than ever. You know, uh, that anger that I built up, I let it out when I fought March 5th mm -hmm. in 2016. Exactly. Only a month ago, and and I became the new WBO world champion. So I came right. here to, to prove everybody wrong and to show everybody that. That last fight, I should have became champion then, right? And now I just, I just proved it. Well, they're saying, or you know, a lot of people say, if you had won that fight against Bradley, you'd be in line to fight Pacquiao now. And now Bradley and Pacquiao, feel like, how do you feel about that? And who do you have on that on the fight? Well, I wish them both the best. I mean, I, I should have been in that position without a doubt. But you know, uh, things happen for a reason, and and the only thing I could do is just wish them best and and look forward to the rematch and look forward to. Look, looking forward to becoming, being in a better position than they are. Right. You know what I mean, my goal now is to make more money than Bradley, show him that I'm a better fighter, right. and he ain't nothing. Right. You know what I mean, he's, I mean, uh, he doesn't want to give me the rematch. He's 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 dodging uh, the fight against me. So, um, my goals has ch have changed, and I'm just looking forward to the biggest fights out there and becoming the people's champ. You know, uh, fighting the top opposition that we have against us and. You know, giving giving the fans a great fight. So who who uh, who are you thinking? Uh, I know you have a, you're scheduling a fight coming up. So, uh, is that in the works? Do you have a, a already somebody set up? It is. We have a fight in the works sometime in July. There's a few names being mentioned, but mm -hmm. to be honest, we have to wait till this fight is over, the Manny Pacquiao right. Timothy Bradley fight, because the fight is promoted by Top Rank, which mm -hmm. is my promoter as right. well. So uh, once all this is done, we'll be able to sit down, talk, and, and explore the options. I know that Cotto, Miguel Cotto is one of the fighters okay. that we can fight against in June. Uh, Woman on Mark is, a, is an option as well. We have Danny Garcia that says right. he wants to fight with us. So, okay. I mean, the options are, 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 yeah, are open for, yeah. for several fighters. And I'm the champion, so, right. you know, I'm yeah, sure everybody wants good. to take I up mean, the fight. I mean, there's a bunch of people. Um, that, uh, like you said, the Garcia, Thurman, um, uh, Porter, uh, you know, Broner. You know, who, 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 who do you have in mind that you want to face next? Is there it, 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 taking all challengers or? I want to fight them all. I want to take them all out one by one, you know, but uh, we'll start off with the biggest name. You know, uh, we'll start off with Miguel Cotto, see if that fight can can be confirmed soon. If not, then Juan Manuel Marquez. If Juan Manuel Marquez doesn't want to fight, Danny Garcia and Broner, 
You know, I just want to go. I'm lining them up with uh, the fighters that have the most recognition mm -hmm. because I know that's the fight that the fans would prefer to see. Yeah. And if that can't go on, well, I'll go to the next, the next name. Right. Um, also, okay, you're a Las Vegas guy. Uh, I know you're not uh, born here, but you lived here all your life, so you, you're considered a, a native. Um, uh, tell us about you know your programs here, because I know you work with kids uh, here, and you have a couple of organizations. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, uh, and how it? I guess does it help you with your fighting and you know giving back to the community? Well, I like to be involved with with my community and and more than anything the youth, because I feel that I can relate to them more and I can make a difference in their lives, you know, and, and, and help them in their future. And I'm involved with, tremendously with uh, Clark County, you know, and anything that they do. Mm -hmm. I'm involved with Springmount Youth Camp and with several boxing gyms that are around the Las Vegas area. Uh, Center Ring Boxing being one of them, City Athletic the other, uh, Fernando Vargas Boxing Gym, uh, s several, several, I can't name them all right now, but, uh, you know, the Springmount Youth Camp as well. and. In any opportunity that we get to speak to the kids, you know, we, we take advantage of it. And um, you know, it only benefits us because it benefits me knowing that I'm, I'm doing something positive. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm living my dream, but while doing it, I'm also giving back. I'm also helping other troubled uh, kids that are, that are having trouble. Uh, you know, teenage, the teenage years for all of us, I believe, is, it's always been tough. Mm -hmm. And if you have someone to guide your just to kind of give you some, some, some tips on how to, how to succeed in life and how to accomplish your goals and, yeah. and how, how to believe in yourself. Right. You know, it's, it's, it makes a big difference. I and that's all I'm trying to do. Yeah, no, I think that's important. And I think that's something that's missed, you know, to now, nowadays and should be, should be addressed. So I thank you, Jesse, for coming out. Um, thanks for our guest, Jesse. We're going to be head, uh, go back to the desk with John and Cassie. Uh, thanks, for, uh, er, thanks for tuning in. Buckle up, race fans. NHRA weekend was a memorable one at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway with two funny car track records being set by Jack Beckman and Courtney Force. Leonardo Schauer with the story. Cruz Pedregon, Tommy Johnson Jr., and Chad Head. Some of drag racing's biggest stars graced the speedway last weekend for a round of funny car action in the Mellow Yellow event. Many fans in attendance came to see some of their favorite drivers. I really like watching the cars go down the, the track and I really like Jack Beckman. He, he's one of the nicest drivers here, I think. I, this is one of my favorite things I like to come to. Two-time world champion Fast Jack Beckman had an outstanding qualifying round, reaching a top speed of 322.88 miles an hour on day one for a time of 3.916 seconds, setting a speedway track record. For the Rubble Report, Leonardo Schauer. Sunday's big winners were Antron Brown in Top Fuel, Alexis DeJoria in Funny Car, and Jason Line in Pro Stock. The NHRA drag racers now head to Charlotte, North Carolina on April 22nd to compete in the Four Wide Nationals. All right, so it's a weekly tradition for UNLV Athletics to name Outstanding Rebel of the Week. The sports information staff voting on who the top performing athlete across all sports is. And this week's honor goes to men's swimming team member Dylan Verva, and he's fast. Verva recently took ninth place in the 50-meter freestyle at the NCAA Men's Championship in Atlanta last week, making this the highest individual finish for a Rebel at the NCAA level since 2000. He also placed 33rd in the 100 freestyle, a, a personal best for him in the event. Verva finishes off his final collegiate competition as the seventh Rebel to earn individual All-American status at least twice in a career. Verva is a senior majoring in Earth and Environmental Sciences and plans on going into a career week where he can be outside and hopefully continue swimming. Show me your skills. Time for this week's Show Me Your Skills, where Rebel Report Summer Crawley got the chance to hang with one of the kickers from the football team and show us how it's done. We're here at Rebel Park with UNLV football kicker, Nico Bornan, with this week's Show Me Your Skills. In this week's segment, starting kicker, Nico Bornan teaches us how to kick a football. So there's actually three ways you can kick a football. It's nothing like a soccer ball. So my way is I'm down in this stance and I, I don't club foot. This is club and then this is three quarter club. And then this is soccer style where you're really underneath the ball. 
and that's more how I kick it. And usually kickers do this style, but a lot of them do the three-fourths club, I believe. So that's how you kick a football. So Nico here says it's not that really easy to kick a field goal, so I'm going to try it. How do you think I'll do? I think you'll do great. I think you'll make it. I think you'll do great. Let's test it out. It's not as easy as it looks, and kicking a football is nothing like kicking a soccer ball. With the right ball placement, steps, and relaxation, I came up short for the extra point. Well, thank you, Nico, for showing us how to kick a field goal. And you guys can check out Nico and the rest of the football squad at their home opener against Jackson State September 1st. For the Rebel Report, I'm Summer Crawley. And I'm Nico Bornan. Thank you, guys. Nice job, Summer, except for the kicking part. Um, whatever Nico's style is, it's probably a good one. Uh, Bornan with a very solid sophomore season, making 12 of 17 field goals and 43 of 44 extra points this past season. You can catch Nico on the field during the spring showcase at noon on Saturday. All right, so that's it. Thanks for tuning in for this week's edition of the Rebel Report. We got guests, Jesse Vargas in here. A lot of people coming through our doors, so we appreciate everybody that's coming on. And thanks again to all of you who continue to watch as we grow and we continue to get better here. You can catch up on our previous shows on our YouTube channel, Rebel Report UNLV. Also tweet us if you have any sports stories for us at Rebel Report UNLV. And follow us on Instagram at Rebel Report underscore UNLV. See you next week.